Today, we are on the last of an installment of the series that we've called Teach Us to Pray. And we want to just talk about this last aspect and component of prayer. There's so much more that we could talk about, but we thought we'd just take three weeks at the beginning of August, along with our 21 days of prayer, and explore how to pray, how to pray prayers that are successful. The first week, we talked about the authority that God has given us because we live in a physical body here on the planet, and how important it is for us to understand that concept. The second week, last week, we talked about the fact that many of us pray, we're frustrated because because our prayers aren't answered and we don't understand why. Then we give up. So we talked about a lot of the reasons why our prayers don't get answered last week. If you missed any of those, you can always go to Facebook and catch up those messages uh, that you missed there. This week, we want to talk about the ultimate prayer. The prayer that is completely aligned with what God is wanting to do here in the world and what he's wanting to do in the earth. It's completely aligned. How many of you, you've ever gotten your spine a little bit out of alignment? Anybody? Like your back was a little bit wonky and you went to the chiropractor. I mean, the chiropractor. Anybody ever went to one of those guys? This is the only place that I can think of where we will trust a person to take our neck in our hands and that he's not going to snap our neck and kill us. And we think as soon as he moves our neck and it pops like 17 times, we are dead. Anybody ever, you're like, I just died. Oh, wait, I'm still here. I don't know what happened. And you think, you know, he's like, okay, I want you to bend your leg like a pretzel and put your hand behind your head. You're like up in this ball. And he's like, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go across the room. And I've got a wrestler outfit. Pay no attention to that. I'm going to take off running and I'm going to jump as high as I can. I'm going to come down with my knee like, right in the middle of your back, and you're going to pay me like 40, 50 bucks for it. And I'm like, what is wrong with this picture? You know, and he hisses, and you're like, oh, thank you. It feels so much better. Anybody ever had that happen? And you're like, this is awful. Like, and then you leave, and you're like, whoa, I do feel better. I mean, the pain was, like, he said, here's the problem. And he takes your spine out, and he shows it to you. Like, it's not supposed to be like that. I know. Like, put it back in. Put it back in. So you go to the chiropractor, but when you leave, you're like, this is so much better because I'm in alignment. Like, my body works, and I'm not walking like this. He said, That's your legs are shorter than the one leg's shorter because your spine's messed up. So he fixes it. All our pain goes away. The same thing, I believe, happens in our prayer life. We get out of alignment, and we're praying hard. We're doing all that we can. We're leaning into God. We really love Him, but our prayers aren't lined up with what He's wanting to do in the earth, and so we're messed up. It doesn't work. So the disciples of Jesus came to Him, and they said, Lord, would you teach us how to pray? John taught his disciples, would you do the same thing for us. And this is in Luke. It's also in Matthew. We're going to read in the, in the book of Matthew chapter 6. If you have a Bible, you want to turn there. If not, it'll be on the screen. But Jesus gives us this prayer. All of us know it, but it's the ultimate pattern for prayer. It's not just a prayer, but it's a pattern also. We're going to dig through it today. Let's read this in Matthew 6. Jesus said, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, how many of you in some form of an, or another, maybe not those exact words, you have this prayer memorized, you've known it like all your life. Yeah. You hear this prayer prayed many times. Uh, you hear it prayed a lot of times in, in, uh, in uh, times when there's different denominations of churches that come together. This is just a prayer. It's the Lord's Prayer. It's a safe prayer to pray. There's times when we come together. Uh, maybe you, you see a sports team kneel down on the field before they begin the match, and they'll pray this prayer. And it's a great prayer. You can pray just this prayer. But there's so much more happening in what Jesus said to his disciples than just the words themselves. There are principles behind every word and every phrase that give us a clue to the way God wants us to pray in a way that it's always in alignment with his will. And that means if it's in alignment with his will, we learned last week, it's 100% successful. How many of you want to pray 100% successful prayer? Absolutely. We want God to answer our prayers. So let's dive into this and pick this apart a little bit by little bit and understand this is like a, like a four or five week series at least by itself. So I've got to hurry. So you got to listen fast. Are you going to listen fast? Yes. Okay. That was really, the response was a little slow. Here we go. All right. Our Father. We start with this phrase, our Father. Now we're going to look right here. I've highlighted the word our and so we're starting with just the word our in the top of the whole prayer. Our Father. 
Not just my father, but our father. You notice the difference? Right out of the gate, Jesus begins to confront the problem that is the source of almost all of our problems in the world. And that is this. It's that you and I really believe the center of the universe is us. We believe that God was made so that he could meet our needs rather than he made us. We get it all backwards. And Jesus immediately confronts the root issue that every human being has. And it is this. Your problem is you. My problem is me. Our Father, he's confronting the self-problem. He puts us in a context to where he says, when you pray, you need to be thinking bigger than just you. The word that needs to be in your mind is we, not me. We are praying now an others-centered prayer. And there's a clue in this that if we would say our, it would imply that we're together with someone else when we pray. Interesting. Interesting. That the, that the implication in the Lord's Prayer of what Jesus says out of the gate is that He expects the majority of our prayer life to be with someone else. Why would He do that? Because the Bible says in other... He, Jesus actually said in the New Testament in another place, if any two or three of you agree as dealing with any matter on the earth, it will be answered and met by your Father in heaven. So there's an implication all through Scripture that God wants us praying together, living in a relationship with one another, that it's not just me and Jesus got my own thing going. Implicit in this prayer is that God expects all of us to be in relationships with others to where we are leading one another and walking with one another in our relationship with God. This right here, this word is the mandate for life groups. Jesus says, I expect you to be in a group of people that are walking this thing out. Not alone, not a lone ranger. There are so many Christians that say, me and Jesus have my own thing going. Like, do you attend church anywhere? Yeah, I attend church at the first couch of my living room. Like, what is that all about? Well, well I mean, I've just been hurt so many times. And I don't get anything out of it. Since when do we get to dictate how we walk out our faith with God? <laughs> Jesus says... In fact, there are over 30 verses in the New Testament that you cannot obey unless you're in a group of other believers. So it doesn't work. It's a mindset of isolation that's in the United States, but it goes counter to the culture of the kingdom. And so here's the thing. We provide three seasons every year for you to get in a group of people and to begin to encourage one another, share scripture, pray for one another, and take next steps that God is challenging you with in your walk with him. Super simple stuff. And we call it life groups because we believe that your life ought to be lived with a group of people that are going the same direction as you. And so we're starting that, season, that life group season at the 1st of September, and today you have the opportunity to get in a group. And I'm going to tell you, if you've never been in a group, or if you're not in a group, then you're not going to have what God wants you to experience in your life, because it's our Father, not my Father. He wants you to be in a group of people. This is how we lead our church. It's how we, it's how we uh, pastor our people. So many people will say, well, who's, who's my pastor? Who's my leader? Who's going to visit me in the hospital? Your group leader will do that. The people in your group. There's so many times we go into a season to where something happens in people's lives and Nick or myself or Beth or Amy will show up on the scene and guess what? The life group has already taken care of all of the need because people are actually in a place where they can walk together in community. So if you're not in a life group, this is the mandate on your life this season for the first time. Get in a group. And you're going to experience a level of a, a Christian life and Christian living that you've never, ever known before. I personally, and we together as a campus, believe that's as important, if not maybe even more important than what we're doing right here. Because when you're with a group of people, that's when you can begin to grow. You can't do life alone. So our Father is the first thing. Then he says, Father. So now we're going to say our, so we said our Father. Now we're going to say our Father. Everybody say that with me. Our you're like, this is going to take a long time. We're going to go through the, You know what? Where somebody does a sentence and you emphasize each word, you know, like differently. You put the different emphasis on the different syllables of the words. So, so here's the thing. We're going to go through this prayer, but we're not going to break it down a single word at a time. Don't panic. You're always like, whew, this is going to be like years, years long. Okay. All right. So this is what Jesus is saying. First of all, it's a context of community. The second thing is we're talking to a father. Jesus is saying, who's your daddy? 
And the reason he does this is because in the context of the culture where Jesus appears, everyone is relying on religion. Because there's a distance between humanity and God. There's such a formality in, the, in Judaism when Jesus shows up on the scene that they will not even write the full name of God. They will write G-D. They will write his name Yahweh and they'll bring out all the vowels because they think it's so respectful to have this close relationship with God. So we'll honor the God that's up there, the man in the sky, the, God, the man upstairs. We'll, we'll honor that guy, but come close to him? No, but Jesus said his earthly ministry was designed to reveal to us the Father. God wants a close relationship with us. Something happened in humanity when Adam and Eve abandoned their relationship with God and sinned. And it is this, is that since that time, every single person on the planet was born an orphan in their spirit. And many of us come to God and we trust Him for our salvation, but we never change from God to Father. We never understand that there's a deeper relationship, and so we count on Him for our ticket to heaven. We count on Him for our insurance policy against hell. But it never gets deeper than that. We only come to Him when things are falling apart in our life. And it's sad to me that when I see people show up to church when there's a crisis, it's as predictable as the day is long. You let something happen in the family, you let um, uh, some type of mountain or circumstance rise up, and people run to God. You let our nation have a tragedy, and the first thing that everybody wants to do, everyone who's a pagan, everyone who says, no, 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 we don't want prayer in schools, we don't want prayer in anything, what do we do? Let's pray. And we treat God as this entity or this being that we run to only when we have to. And God says, I'm not having that. I'm not having a transactional relationship. I'm sending you my son so that he can reveal to you who I actually am. You want to know what your father's like? Look at Jesus. And so God is saying, I don't want a transactional relationship where you come to church and check the box and you're so excited that you did this or you served extra this month and we're patting ourselves on the back. He's like, no, no, no. I want a relationship. I'm father. And this whole prayer, just understand, the entire prayer hinges right here. You can't move on to any of the rest of it until you understand I have a relationship with my Father. Then he says, our Father in heaven. We're locating God. God's not here. God's in heaven. If God was here, guess what? This would be heaven. There's a problem with that. That means anything that's in you and in, in any other person that doesn't look like heaven would have to be killed. There'd be a lot of death on the planet. So God is in heaven. God is there. Heaven is not here. And so we're, it's like we are ambassadors, like the Bible says. We are picking up the phone and talking back to the land for which sent us to this place to bring heaven to it. And realizing God is there and understanding our role is to talk to the headquarters and get resources from the headquarters to make the earth look like heaven does. It says that this, we're responsible to do something. God's not going to just show up on the planet. He's staying in heaven. We're here. And we're supposed to do something for him. Then he goes on. He says, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. We're saying here, God, there is nobody like you. You are set apart. There's no one that understands anything but you. You are the creator. You are the source of all wisdom, all knowledge, all strength. The source of all life. There's no one. We want to come to you for the answers. We are worshiping him in this moment. Now, you need to understand sometimes when we worship God, we think of it in the context as that we are making we are worshiping him, making him bigger and lifting him up. But part of worship is also this, is for us to bow down. We are making him bigger and we are making ourselves smaller. We are coming to him in humility saying, "Hallowed be your name. You're the one with all the wisdom and solutions. We want yours, not ours." And we're saying, we don't want to be without you. Father, hallowed is your name. Holy is your name. We want to be with you. We want to walk in relationship with you. We want to hear from you. Positioning ourselves before the Lord. And then we move to the next thing Jesus taught us to say. And he said, say this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In March, we did a whole series on thy kingdom come. So I don't have as long to spend on this today. But what we're saying in this is, Father, the earth is broken. How many of you would agree that the earth is broken? We had issues. 
We got problems. And what we need is your ideas. We need heaven to come to earth. We need the government of heaven to come here. We need you to intervene in the problems we have here. And we know this. It's our responsibility. We've talked about that a lot. Many of you may not realize that God has actually given us a kingdom from which we are to rule and reign and bring His government, bring His goodness to the earth. It's our responsibility. But what we're praying here, Lord, is we want to align with what you want done. We want to align with your will and your kingdom. And we want to do this, but we're asking you to send us some resources. Hey, we're here, by the way, in the distant land. And we see all the problems we have. And so we we're, going to, we're going to talk to you about we need your kingdom here. And so we need you to give us the resources that we need to make this happen here. Every single person on this planet is looking for the same thing. I want you to think about this with me. Regardless of whether a person is a Muslim, regardless of whether they are a Buddhist, regardless of whether they're just a humanist, agnostic, Atheist, Christian, go down, I don't know all the religions off the top of my head, but go down every single one and then take religion off the table and just say every single person on the planet, they're all looking for the same thing. They're looking for utopia. They're looking for a better world. Every single person wants to know meaning, they want to know purpose, and they want to see a better world. That's why you and I are never satisfied with the house that we live in. We think there's a better house in a better neighborhood and we take it. We think that there's a better job, so we leave the one that we have to look for the better job. It's the reason there's so many refugees in the world that are willing to leave everything behind and just go to a new country in hopes that they can find something better. And then this prayer, Jesus is saying there absolutely is. There's one way that everything works. It's when heaven comes to earth through the men that I sent here. And so we're saying, God, we need your resources and your ideas to help us make earth look like heaven. But there's an implication here. There's a problem with this prayer. The implication is this. is we're saying, God, all this out here is a mess. Like that company over there, they're polluting polluting everything. We we need that fixed. And this governmental policy, that's ridiculous. we got to have that changed. And the things that are happening to these people in the world, it's not okay. It's unjust. you got to fix all that. But the implication is this. If we're praying God fix all this, the first thing he's saying is you got to fix this. For the kingdom to be here, the kingdom first has to be here. And so first of all, we want to ask him to bring heaven here. That we carry the culture of heaven. Elizabeth Elliot said this, To pray thy will be done, I must be willing, if the answer requires it, that my will be undone. Lord, before you try to fix anybody else, please fix me. Before I try to go bring the solutions of all my brilliance and the things that I want to accomplish in the world. Would you fix me? I want your kingdom to come here. I want your will to be done here. And here's the question this morning. A great thing to ponder and reflect today is do you look like heaven? We talked about last week that many things that we ask for, we're asking God to violate the culture of heaven. We're asking God to violate His will in heaven. Things that don't exist there, we're asking Him to do for us here. And the question is, are we living our lives to where we're saying, Lord, we want Your kingdom, but not in that. We want Your will, but we don't want to obey that. For us to do that, we have to align with heaven and say we want to submit fully to Your will and Your purpose. And then he says, pray this. He said, pray, give us today our daily bread. There is so much here. I wish I had six months to just talk about the implications in this one line. Because our Father in Heaven wants us to get to a place to where we are walking in absolute trust. That we can trust Him for just today. That we're not worried about tomorrow. We're not placing ourselves 24 hours ahead on the clock. 40 hours, 48 hours, 96 hours, uh, six months and a year ahead on the clock trying to figure things out and stress over everything of our lives because we know that our Father is taking care of us day by day by day. 
This is, remember at the beginning we had to say our father. And this goes to the heart of what is an orphan mind. See, an orphan believes they're responsible for their protection and their provision. It's two things that happen when, when someone is cut off from their parental covering. Is that they're now responsible for their protection and provision. Who's going to take care of me? I'm going to take care of me. And we spend the bulk of our lives not focusing on God's purpose for us, but focusing on finding our way through provision and our protection. Every single thing that happens in this world that is evil and wicked comes from this root right here. We don't trust God. It was the original thing that happened in the garden when the, Satan, when the serpent said, you shouldn't trust him. He's holding something back from you. And that, in the mo- that is the core of all sinfulness. It is the reason that there's broken homes. It is the reason that there's broken companies. It is the reason that there's broken families. It is the reason that there's broken countries. It is the reason that there's rape. It is the reason that there is genocide, incest. You go through every single sin. It is rooted in the fact that I'm going to get mine. Because we don't trust our Father. And listen, this is something I'm walking through right now and I'm having trouble with it, okay? So I'm not like preaching at you, I'm just preaching to myself. i got a mirror, I'm looking at myself. But God wants to bring us to a place where we really understand and know this. And, he, and later on, in the same chapter, in Matthew 6, 31 to 33, he said, if you'll seek the kingdom, if you'll pursue God's purpose for your life and align with that, all these other things you've been freaking out about, I got them. They'll be added to you. Everything you need will be supplied if you'll pursue me and what I want to do in the world. Put me first. And if we could learn this, it was, this would destroy all stress, all fear, all fights, all worry in every war. Right here. Give us today what we need for today. When Israel uh, left Egypt and they were walking in the wilderness, God said, I'm going to supply for you every single day. They were like, where are we going to get food? There was nothing there. And so God said, I'm going to miraculously provide for you. And so manna came on the ground like dew. And they would go out in the morning and collect it. And when they first saw it, the first day that they saw it, God had already warned them. He said, okay, tomorrow morning, you're going to see this manna. And when you go out there, only get enough for your family for today. Because it'll be there tomorrow. And they did what every one of us do. They got two days worth. And more. And when they woke up on the second day, what they had gathered for the second day had worms in it. And God said, how long are you not going to trust me? I will give you every day what you need for that day, and what you need for that day, and what you need for that day. How can we have this kind of confidence? We can only have this confidence when we move from religion to relationship, first of all, and understand he's actually our dad. And then we can only have it when we know that we're aligned with the Father and doing what He has called us to do. Then we have the right to ask for our daily bread. Because we're aligned with His kingdom. Dad has got me because I'm working for the kingdom. And then He says this, Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. A debt is a legal obligation. How many of you, okay, don't raise your hand. How many of you got any debt? Don't raise your hand. Like everybody's hands. I'm like, oh, I got that. Ah. So it's a legal obligation. You have to pay it back. Sin is described as a legal obligation. We are in debt to God. Now, here's the thing when you and I sin against God, it is a criminal matter. Why? Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. The penalty for death, for, for sin, is death when we sin against God. And so you and I, when we sin against God, we have a legal document posted against us in a criminal court. And if the verdict is guilty, we die. But Jesus came and brought us a kingdom to administer. He gave, us, he gave us access to the Father through His blood. And He said, okay, I've dealt with this relationship. Now you are a king and a priest, and I expect you to deal with this one. You administer this kingdom in the civil matter. So we're over here. We have sinned against God, and we have a criminal docket, a criminal uh, something, whatever it is, written against us that we have to appear before the court. We are the defendant. And yet you and I are over here in a civil matter because somebody hurt our feelings, didn't call us back or do whatever, and we've got an offense against them, and we won't forgive them. And so now over here, we're the plaintiff. And so literally, this verse paints the picture That the criminal court is just waiting for notice that you and I have dropped the civil argument. You have the power of your own forgiveness before the Lord. 
He said, forgive us our debts as we have done our part. We've released the debt that others have against us. This is a hard thing to swallow, but Jesus said in multiple places, he said, your father won't forgive you if you don't forgive others. And so many of us are in our walk with God, we have a relationship with him and we're trying to pray and we've got this block because God says, you need to deal with that. You're like, yeah, but I just need my daily bread. You need to, you need to deal with that. Yeah, I don't want to have to deal with that. I want to keep going. Jesus fixed the vertical. He said, you have to deal with the horizontal. You have to forgive. And then he says this, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I think this is a little bit unfortunate of a translation because it sounds as though God would lead us somewhere that we would be tempted. And we know that no man is tempted by God. Scripture tells us that. This better translation of this would be, God, don't let us be led into temptation by our own desires. Don't let us fall to temptation. Keep us with you. Keep us from the consequences of sin. Have you ever scolded your kids when they're getting close to hurting themselves? Like you got onto them to try to warn them you weren't close to them. And you're like, hey, hey, stop. Anybody ever done that? What do they do? They start crying. <laughs> Is that unloving? No, it's love, isn't it? Because you're protecting them from something worse. Like when you spank them. Dear God, I hope we have some spankers in here this morning. So you got to protect your kids with their life by spanking them. I mean, come on. We need to be some people who put the, put the belt on them a little bit and say, we have got to discipline our kids because we love them. Not because we're mad at them, putting bruises on them. That's ridiculous. You need to get in court for that. So that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but... Discipline and correction is love. And we're saying, God, correct me. If I'm going the wrong way, I want to be rebuked. I want to be corrected. I want to be brought back in because I trust you. You're my father. I want to yield when you say no. And the question is to you today is, are you yielding to the Lord when he says no? I believe that one of the, one of the big issues that we have in the church today is that the church can't figure out this relationship with God thing. And so churches run to one end of a spectrum. We become very religious or we become hyper grace. We don't know how to do it. We can't figure it out. So because we see things that are a problem, then we start making rules and we become very religious. You're like, okay, your, sh your shirt sleeves, are, they're showing your elbows and women lust after that. You have to wear long sleeves, okay? So you have to do that. You need to, you need to stop cutting your hair, women. That needs to be longer. Like, well, I don't have any hair. Okay, well, then you need to get a wig that's long. I don't know. We start making up all these rules and all these things in religion, having an outward appearance that we love God, but it's just ritualistic. We're not anywhere close to Him. We're actually really ugly people on the inside. So we're like, we don't like that. And I, I'm with you. I don't like that. I grew up in that. So we run all the way to the other side and we're like, we're just going to be, oh, God loves me. God loves you just no matter what. Jesus, Jesus loves you. He just, he just loves you. He loves you as you are. He loves you exactly as you are. And he does. But then you and I call him our father. And then our family values are anything but his values. Paul said, man, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Well, yeah, that's awesome. So if I sin, God's like, more grace? He's like, yeah. He's like, woohoo! I can do whatever I want. And he's like, should we continue as sin? No way. Why? Because you and I bear a name when we tell people we're Christians. What that means is we are little Christs. So if you want to know what Jesus is like, just look at my life. If you want to know what heaven looks like, just come to my house. Because nothing is in my house that doesn't exist in heaven. Nothing is in my life that doesn't exist in heaven. And so what you and I do is we run to either end of the spectrum and we never find the transforming power that was made available through the Holy Spirit and what God wants to do to where, we, yes, we get to go to heaven because even though we're broken and we've got all this stuff, but we let ourselves off the hook and rely on God's grace to get us to heaven. And instead of seeing that His grace is given to transform our lives... And so then we say to people, you should come be a Christian. We divorce the same. We've got abuse the same. We're addicted just like everybody else. We're broken like everybody else. But at least you can go to heaven. And people are like, why would I do that? Your king is weak. It is a slap in the face of our father. 
that we choose to read God's word and he says, stop it. And we're like, is there something else? I look to the hills from where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. God is going to give me the victory. That's how we behave as Christians. And this, I, I may seem angry. I'm not angry. I'm broken. And I'm like, God, you've got to give us a solution as believers to where we understand I am forgiven absolutely. There's nothing that I can do to work my way into heaven. But now that you have dealt with the, entire, uh, the entirety of my sin and my brokenness on the cross, you sent the Holy Spirit to be a governor that is inside me. And I don't have to be broken anymore. I don't have to be addicted anymore. I don't have to look like hell on my way to heaven anymore. He's got power for us to be transformed. It's incredible. I will yield when you say no. I will say yes when you ask me to say yes. Some transcripts later added this, so I'm just going to say it because a lot of us have prayed it. It's not in your text. It was added later. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And it's just kind of a benediction to the whole thing. Lord, we're praying all of this because it all came from you. Everything we have, it's yours. Every breath that we have, every heartbeat that we have, it's all yours. And so we're just acknowledging that this whole thing is wrapped up in you. It's not about me. It's about you. And I thank you for your favor. I thank you for your grace for today. I thank you for your love today. And I just want to align with your kingdom and your will and your way. Because it's best. So this is the prayer that 100% of the time is answered every time. And I want to show you the principles of the Lord's Prayer. You may not have seen it before. You may not have realized what's happening as we pray this prayer. But there are six principles that are laid out through this prayer. And the first one is this. The first thing that happens in this prayer is that it aligns us with others' centeredness. The first thing that we have to do when we say the word our is to take the center of the universe and put it outside ourselves. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. The world doesn't revolve around us, Jesus is saying. It's part of something bigger. He loves us, but he doesn't just love us. See, he's got some kids outside here today that didn't make worship because they don't know about him yet. So there's an others centeredness. The second thing it does is it aligns us with the fact that we have a father. You say, Father, hallowed. Your name is holy. There's nobody like you. I don't have another dad like you. I don't want another dad like you. I want to serve you. You're the best. Holy are you. You're set apart. There's none like you. And then it aligns us with his rule and his reign. God, I don't want my way. I don't want my will. I want your way. I want your will. I want to do what you say, not what I come up with. And so whatever you're asking of me today, I want to say yes to. I want your rule and reign. After this happens, watch this. After these first things, three things happen in this prayer, only then, only then do we go to number four, a request for provision. You know how our prayers start? Good morning, Lord. Uh, today, uh, I have a stressful appointment. And I would like you to go before me and make that work out. I have to talk to my boss or I have to go to the doctor. Father, I uh, just got this bill and I don't have the money to pay. We start right here. But Jesus said, wait, wait, wait. Time out. Let's go back to the top. Why don't you move your center outside yourself? Why don't you get in a relationship rather than dealing with religion and just coming up, showing up to church and checking the box? When things break, you come to church. It's like, man, we have a crisis in our life and we're going to show up this week. Well, no, why don't you literally align with the relationship that God is trying to give you? And then why don't you say, I'm going to make your will and your rule and your reign, I want to make that my priority. Whatever you want to do, that's what I want to do. And then when you do that, guess what? That's why in Matthew 6, 31 to 33, we don't like to say the first part, seek first the kingdom, and then these things will be added to you. We just like to take the second half of that verse and say, all things will be added to you. He said, no, no, no. When you're aligned with heaven and pursuing its purpose, then these things will be added to you. It requests provision. Then we request reciprocal restoration. I felt like I should put that word reciprocal in there because you and I, so many times, we want to be able to hold ought against other people but expect God to forgive us. And he said, no, it's not going to work that way. You have to deal with your problems with other people. And then all this will be fine. And then finally, it requests protection. I want you to see this. 
problem in humanity is that we are orphans. That we don't trust our Father. And Jesus gives us a prayer that the principles behind it deal with every bit of an orphan spirit. He said, you're not alone. You're in a family, a group of people. That family has a father. He's with you. That father's got some rules for the house. And those, those rules aren't just to keep you from doing something. It's to keep you from hurting yourself and other people. So we're going to play some, by some rules to honor one another. And so you'll be all right, because when they do something against you, I'm going to take care of them. Trust me, I'm your dad. And then all the things that you need for your life, I'm providing. Don't worry about it. I got you. And you're going to be in relationships that are healthy. For the first time in your life, in the kingdom of God, it's the only place that relationships can really be healthy because you're going to have reciprocal restoration. I'm going to go tell you to make things right with your brothers and sisters. And then finally, I got you. I'm going to protect you. I will sustain you. It deals with every part of you. Jesus gives us the ultimate alignment ultimate prayer that deals with the human condition and says I'm going to make sure that if you pray this prayer and you are aligned with me when we pray this prayer, your answer is every time 100% yes if you pray this prayer. Everything that you need is in the family of the Father. So this morning what we're going to do as a response together is we're going to activate this. We're going to pray this prayer together. So here's what I want you to do across the room. I want you to stand and we're going to pray. And let me say this before we pray, that you don't have to have the right words. There are no right words. Okay. There's tons of people that I hear sometimes that they, they say, well, I asked them to pray for me. And they were like, I don't know how to pray because they think that I have like all these big words. You don't have to say, oh, great father, hallowed God, if God in heaven, they don't have to have TH on the end of every word. How would you talk to your best friend? Because God is your friend. He wants to be close to you. How would you talk to somebody that is near you in relationship? So that's how we're going to talk, okay? So I'm just going to talk like this to God. Second thing is you need to open your mouth and speak loud enough that you can hear your own voice. I don't have to hear what you're saying. Your neighbor doesn't have to hear what you're saying, but you need to open your mouth and speak. And what we're going to do is we're going to pray through that prayer, and it is going to take us exactly 10 minutes. We already have the slides timed. But we've broken down this prayer so that we could pray every single section. Can you hang with me for 10 minutes? All right, I'm going to ask nobody to leave during this time unless, like, you got an emergency, you got, like, a potty break that you have to have, like, an, by all means, go. All right? But if you don't have to leave, I want you to pray this prayer and maybe for the first time realize what you're doing, that you're aligning with heaven and praying a prayer that your Father is saying, yes, yes, yes. So let's put the first one on the screen. Band's going to play so that you can pray out loud. Our Father, we're going to pray for needs and for the salvation of, not yours, others. I want you to begin to pray for your friends. I want you to begin to pray for your neighbors. I want you to pray for your co-workers that God would bring salvation to them, that they would have the same relationship with Him that you have, that they would have the same type of relationship that a worship of Him that you experience today that every need they have, maybe they have sickness in their body, I want you to bring them before the Lord. Lord, you know they're sick. You know they're not doing well. I'm asking you to meet their needs. Lord, I'm asking you, if necessary, to use me to meet their needs. Come on, lift your voice. We don't have much time left. It's already started. Father, we pray right now for our neighbors. We pray for our co-workers. I'm asking you, Lord, that whatever they need, that you meet that need in their life. Lord, even if you need to use me as a resource for that, my time, my talent, my energy. In Jesus' name, I'm asking you that you would pour me out on behalf of others, that I don't make the world all about me. Move my center off of myself and put it on other people, I pray, in the name of Jesus. I'm asking you, Lord, that our neighbor, my neighbors, that my friends and my coworkers would be saved. Lord, I thank you that every single one of them would come to salvation, the knowledge of Jesus, and the, and the security of heaven after this life in the name of Jesus. Now let's pray about him as Father. Thank him that you, he's your Father, not a distant God. If you're comfortable, call him Father. If you're comfortable, call him Papa. Just call him, just like you would call your dad. You call him your dad. Lord, I thank you that you're not a distant God. You're not somebody that's so far removed from us that you're the big guy in the sky, the man upstairs. But instead, you're my father. 
that I can count on you as a dad, that I can count on you maybe for that piece of my heart that's been missing because I never had a dad. Uh, my dad was never present in my life. My, never, my dad told me I was never good enough or my dad told me that I would never mount to anything. But you're not like that. You're my dad. You're my father. You're my protector. You're my provider. You're the one that secures my life. I love you. I thank you of who you are, that you're not distant, that you're not removed from me that I don't have to worry whether or not I can come into this room to be close to you. But every single moment of every single day that I can be close to you, that I can know you're right there with me. I thank you that you are my Father. And I thank you that I don't have to be formal with you, but I just come and sit on your lap and pour my heart out to you. Let's say now, hallowed be your name. I want you to worship him for his holiness. Honor him for his wisdom and his goodness. Focus on him. There's nobody like him. There's nobody like you, Lord. There's no one that has wisdom. All wisdom comes from you. Everything that is good comes from you. When we look around us on this planet, we say some person invented this. No, they didn't. It came out of you. You put it in them. You invented it and put it inside them so that they could vent it in this world. Everything good that we see comes from you. Lord, I thank you for our bodies. I thank you for air conditioning. I thank you for vehicles. Thank you for your goodness that you pour out on us, Lord. I thank you for relationships. I thank you for my wife. We're such a faithful companion that that is your goodness that you brought to me. There's nobody like you, Lord. You are set apart. No one can compare. Nothing that we can chase, nothing that we can spend our life pursuing, whether it's the affirmation that comes from other people, it's the amount of stuff that we can accumulate so we feel better about ourselves. There's nobody but you. There's nobody like you. We worship you. We honor you. We glorify you. And we lift you up. We say it's you alone, Lord. Now let's pray. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want to ask the Father to make your life look like heaven. And then everything your life touches look like heaven because you're there. Listen, when you leave this room today, you're not leaving heaven here. You're carrying heaven wherever you go. And everywhere you set your foot and everywhere that you do a report, everywhere that you turn a wrench, that should look like heaven. Because you're there, you're carrying the culture of heaven with you. You should change the lives of people just by your presence because they're coming into contact with heaven. So, Father, I ask you that everything in my life would look like heaven. If there's anything in me that dishonors you, that disrespects you, that is against the culture and the nature of my Father in heaven, reveal it, drive it out. I surrender it today. I want to look just like you. When people see me, I want them to say, He looks just like His Father. I pray that I would carry the culture. I pray that I would carry the atmosphere of heaven. That I would be ready to hear from your voice because I know you're not distant, you're close. That you want to speak to other people through me. I thank you for it, Lord, that everything I touch looks like you. That it has your fingerprints and your power released in it. Come on now, let's pray for our daily bread. What do you need from the Lord today? Ask Him for what you need in all areas. Maybe you need wisdom. Maybe you need strength. Maybe you need healing. Maybe you need, uh, I don't know what your situation is in your life, but just begin to pour it out. You ask Him. Ask Him right now. Open your mouth. Say it. Lord, I need... Father, I need strength in my body. Lord, I need you to supernaturally sustain my body. Lord, I ask for renewal of my strength. Lord, we're in your presence today, and you said that if we wait upon you, that we'll renew our strength. I need my strength refreshed today. Lord, I ask you for health in my body. I ask you for health for Amy over our lives. I ask you for health for Allie. Lord, I pray today that you would just begin to supply everything that we need. Lord, I ask for wisdom as the pastor of this church, that you would guide my prayers, that you would guide my decisions in my life as we begin to step into the next phase of what it is that you're doing, that I would know exactly what you're calling for and asking for, and that I would have the faith and the courage to obey. In Jesus' name, let's pray now. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. So this is important now. If you have something that you need to release that you're holding against somebody, now's your time. Let it go. Let it go. I forgive them for, say it out loud, whatever it is. Somebody's done you wrong. I know it. 
I can feel it in this room. There's some people that say, I'm not going to do this. But here's the thing. You're in control of your relationship with your father. He said, no, no, no. Don't come talk to me until you fix that with them. And how crazy is it that we would ask God to forgive us of something that is so big, but not release somebody, somebody for something that is so small. So I want you to forgive them out loud, and then I want you to bless them. Father, I forgive them for everything that they've said, everything they've done, every hurt, every word that they said. Lord, when, they, when I thought they had my back, and when I walked away, they stabbed me in the back. Lord, I release it. I don't hold them accountable for it anymore. When I see them, I'm going to be as though it never happened. I'm not going to try to make them pay. I'm not going to try to hold it over their head. I'm not going to hold them at a distance, but I'm going to restore the relationship. And also, I bless them. I pray that everything that their hand touches is blessed by you. I pray that every single thing that they do is blessed by you. I pray that you bless their home. I pray that you bless their health. I pray you bless their kids. Everything they have, Lord, give them a promotion on their job. We bless them, Lord. We release them in Jesus' name. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. So let's pray right now for the Father to deliver you from sin and habits. If you're addicted this morning, you've got a habit, now's the time, supernaturally, God wants to set you free. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every single person in this room, including myself, Lord, the sins that are in our life, the things that we have done to betray your trust, the things that we have done to hurt you and to break covenant with you, I ask for forgiveness. But Lord, I pray that you would purge us for everything that is unholy, everything that is unlike you, every addiction, every craving, Lord, from food, the things that we can't lay down, whether it's caffeine, whether it's coffee, whether it is cigarettes, alcohol, whether it's pornography, whatever it is, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we declare it broken in this room. And we pray that you would deliver us from all evil in the name of Jesus. Don't let us fall and succumb to the things that are in our body, but instead let us be faithful to you in Jesus' name. Now we're going to declare for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So let's acknowledge and declare all we have, all we are is his. That hand clap, that's his. That breath that you just took, that's his. That heartbeat, and that heartbeat, and that heartbeat, and that heartbeat is his. That job you have, it's his. That promotion, it's his. That truck you drive, it's his. That house you live in, it's his. Lord, we just live it in your world, and we thank you for the blessing that comes from you and the joy that we have in this room. Thank you for another day to be alive and have such great family and friends and people that love us and they've got our back, and we want to know that we are a part of what you're doing. We thank you for the honor to be a part of your kingdom and your power and your glory. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father, that you're everything. Let's lift him up and let's praise him today. Come on, let's sing that.